me if you yes i can yes doctor okay so recording is in progress so i'm going to talk about the pain in back pain uh, and if i as i've mentioned is that uh, uh, you know back pain is very very common uh, it is you know uh, this is actually a, a chart that was published by uh, health data you can actually access this on the internet and uh, what he has rated is that uh, from 2007 to 2017 low back pain has actually increased from being number two to number one. So it is one of the most, uh, uh, one of the highest, you know, ranking at 24%, uh, only headache coming in second uh, at 17%, and then only diabetes. So these are non-communicable diseases, uh, which is causing a majority of uh, disability in patients in Malaysia. There's so much of back pain, and I, I've been doing back pain for the last almost, you know, since I started working, okay, as a spine surgeon in the last 20 years, and, you know, I see back pain every day. And why is it so important? So instead of talking about a particular disease, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try and demystify certain things, you know, uh, re, uh, a lot of things that I encountered during my, my practice. Number one, which is the, the term slip disc, and then, you know, the term, uh, you know, pain, and, 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 you know, the greater your pain is, the more it gets, uh, the, the more severe your condition is. So those are the things that we need to tackle, and back pain never heals, you know, so that's, again, something which is totally, uh, I'm, I'm going to address, and hopefully I can actually convey to you certain things that you might find interesting. So we're going to start with uh, understanding the, the spine first, the spinal column, what it means by the spinal column. So the spinal column is what keeps us upright. So you have the skull there. Can you see my, my pointer, Amy? Is that it? Yes, yes, we can. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So we're progressing quite well. Now, so you, that's the skull. That's the bottom. That's the front. That's the back. So you have from there, seven cervical bones, okay, seven cervical bones, 12 thoracic bones, five lumbar bones, sacrum, which is basically one bone, but it has initially what there were five bones, but they were all fused together, and also the tailbone known as the coccyx. coccyx. So this is actually all the one, two, three, four, five regions of the spine. Right. And uh, each spinal vertebra is actually catered to what it is actually uh, uh, functioned to uh, make to do. So if you look at the neck, the cervical vertebra, it is small. If you go down to the chest, the thoracic spine, it is bigger. And when you go to the lumbar spine, it is much bigger. This is basically understandable because what the, uh, the cervical spine needs to do is just basically to uh, just load, uh, bear the weight of your head this has to bear, bear the weight of your head, your neck, and your upper chest. This has to bear the weight of your head, your neck, your upper chest, and also your abdomen. So it needs to get larger. And the little hole that you see, the black thing here, are the place where the spinal cord or the spinal nerve lives. And those little funny projections that you see there, almost like dinosaur bones that you see there, those are actually places where muscles are being attached. So this is so the, the spinal vertebra actually starts small from the bottom of your skull and it gets bigger bigger and bigger progressively and it heads down towards your tailbone so the spinal bone is actually being helped by ligaments now ligaments are important they are basically uh, almost like uh, uh, sheets of fibrous band of tissues that holds bone to bone so it prevents the bone from moving too much so it holds the bone in place and makes it move within whatever is allowed. So you have ligaments in front of the spine. So the tummy is there, back is there. So ligaments in front of the spine, ligament at the back of the spine, further ligament inside the spinal column, and there are two other ligaments. So there are one, two, three, four, five ligaments that basically holds the spine. And with that ligament, what you have are the muscles. So you have three layers of muscles ranging from top, uh, deep, superficial to deep. And there are a lot of muscles that actually uh, uh, move the spine. So it's actually made for movement. Then we look into the intervertebral disc. Now, the intervertebral disc is actually almost like a, uh, a cushion now because you have bone here, which is hard. So the intervertebral disc is soft and very much like a cushion. I, I don't quite like the term uh, disc because it means that it is something very, very hard. I like to use the term gel or, or you know shock absorbers because that's what it's meant to be is to absorb the impact and there's a jelly-like structure in the middle and and an outer fibrous layer so it's very much like what i would call as a jelly and a donut all right from that 
And from there, you can see that this is actually a motion segment. I'm going to illustrate this to you with uh, the video next. So uh, uh, shortly, so the spine is actually aligned. If you look from the front, it's straight. If you look from the back, it's also straight. But if you look at the side, there is curvatures in the neck, curvatures in the upper chest, and curvatures in the lower lumbar. So these are the alignments that we, 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 we know that if you know, your body is following this alignment, it is basically uh, normal. This is the video that I spoke to you about. This is to actually look into the spine as a whole, rather than what I have showed you early on as the bone, as the ligament, as the cushions, okay, and as the joint. So basically, the spine functions like a joint. So what you see here, this is bone, this is the cushion, the yellow ones are the nerve, okay? That's the front, that's the tummy, and that's the back. And what you see here is that as we walk, you have 33 shock absorbers absorbing the impact. Okay, so it functions like a shock absorber. And the second thing is that it functions as a joint. So the, the cushion in front compresses when you lean forward and it expands when you lean backwards. And there are a pair of joints. Now, this is what we call the facet joints. Now, these joints are similar to your knee joints, except that you only have two knees, but in the spine, just guess how many joints that you have in the spine. Well, it's been estimated that you have about 77 joints in the spine. Some say 96, some say depending on how you, you count, all right? So basically, you have about 77 joints in the spine. And do you know how many joints that you have in your body? It's about 360. So about slightly less than a third or maybe somewhere about a fourth of the joints that you have in your body is in the spine. So these joints in the, uh, are, are actually responsible for movement. So once again, you have bone, you have the cushion and you have the bone, the cushion X, X and, uh, absorber. The yellow thing there is the nerve that supplies down to your legs, to your hands, to your chest, okay, and down to your neck. And behind that, you have the joints a pair of joints similar to your knees, but you only have two knees, but you have 77 joints in the, uh, in the spine. And these joints, whenever you, not, uh, so whenever you bend forward, it will compress, you bend backwards, it will expand. So what are the functions of the spine? Basically, the spine functions as a load sharing device. So you can see that people can actually, you know, climb on top of shell. So, so I've showed you the part, the, uh, the part where it actually acts as a cushion. So it can absorb the impact uh, of loading. You know, when people are climbing up one or the other. When you are running, all right, it's responsible for upright movement. And also it plays the function as a protector to your spinal cord and your spinal nerve. So, that's the back, that's the, the front here. Okay, so that's the spinal cord and that's the nerve. Now, the other thing that I would like to go back and talk to you about is this concept of, or, or I would say a misconception of uh, slip disc. We've all heard about slip disc. Let, let me tell you this. Slip disc does not exist in the medical literature. If you look up in, in uh, the available literature, there's no such thing as slip disc. And I certainly don't like the term slip disc. Uh, because the term slip disc refers to as if the disc in the spine can slip backwards and therefore hitting the nerve causing pain. Now, I've already showed you earlier on that the disc is actually almost fused to the bone, all right? And there are ligaments in front, at the back, and further all the way to the back, and there are muscles all around. So the disc is very, very much tied to the bone. It will not be able to move. So the term slip disc, unfortunately, denotes that the disc, so the spine is unstable and the disc can slip forward, and therefore it prevents people or it, it makes people afraid to actually bend forward. So I, I don't think that the, the term slip disc is helpful at all. So a lot of times when I see in the clinic patients come to see me, oh, doctor, I have slip disc. I say, oh, no, you mean you have back pain? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yes, yes, I have back pain. You know? so, so the term slip disc to me is, is not really uh, uh, helpful. So let's skip about the function of the spine. Now, the thing that I want you to all remember from that little bit of knowledge about the anatomy of the spine is that the spine is a super 
a stable structure that never ever sleeps. Okay, it never sleeps, it never before, never in the future. It doesn't sleep. It may cause you a bit of pain, but it never sleeps. Okay, so with this, we're going to move on to something which I think is amazing. We're going to talk about pain, all right? And we're going to look about what is pain because. Understanding pain is actually part of the, uh, the, 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 the prerequisite of understanding back pain. So we're going to look at what is the present understanding about pain and how we can actually use that in, uh, you know, in, in understanding uh, back pain. So what is pain? Right. Pain is defined by the, there's, a, there's an association for the study of pain. It's actually a very, very big uh, organization, uh, International Association for the Study of Pain. They revised the, uh, the definition of pain uh, in last year. And what they say is that pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So it's both sensory and it can be uh, emotional that is associated with or resembling that. Okay, now this is a bit funny, associated with or resembling that. So it resembles or it is associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So you have a sensory or emotional experience that resembles, okay, or associated with actual. So if it resembles, that means you do not have tissue damage. If it's associated, that means if you have an, a tissue damage. Now, why it is important that, you know, if you look at the, the definition here, it doesn't say that you have to express that pain, uh, that you have pain. This is because in children, okay, I'm sure mothers would know this. This is teething pain, children who can't speak, even animals. You know that certain, certain you know, emotions are being relayed and you know that this is pain. So pain is not just defined as just a sensory, but it is also an emotional experience as well. So let's look at the, how um, pain is being generated. So this is a, a, a simplified form of your nerve. This is the skin that the nerve runs through your fingers, down to your hand, up to your spinal cord and up to your brain. So it starts off with a noxious stimulus. So you can have either trauma, mechanical trauma, heat or ice or chemical burns. So with this, a noxious stimuli is created and that stimulus sends impulses down your nerves, up to your spinal cord, uh, where it is then perceived in the brain and is transferred from the thalamus to the somatosis somatosensory cortex where pain is generated. Now, this is important because a lot of us will think that pain is being generated at the skin. We do not have pain generators in the skin. We only have uh, senses for trauma, for mechanical, for heat, for ice, or for chemical. Those are the only four senses that we have in our body. But these impulses are being transmitted up to your brain and the brain is the one that generates pain. Now, to say that, the, the, that, that it's all in your brain is oversimplifying it and it's not right. So you need to understand because there are people with pain, but they do not have any noxious stimuli. These are people with persistent pain conditions. So that's another topic for another day, but I'm just going to keep, keep things simple here to say that we do not have pain senses in our body. We only have senses for mechanical heat, ice and also chemical and the pain is being generated by the brain so pain is more of an output of the brain no brain no pain okay so the fact that you have pain shows that you have a brain so the consequences of pain is that you know you get whenever you have pain you either withdraw you get elevated blood pressure and also you have a higher blood pressure uh, sorry pulse rate now, this is important. Pain perception is not necessarily implied. Now, what does this mean? Okay. Now, I know I, I wrote here, feel the pain. And what I've mentioned in my last slide is that you must have some form of input uh, uh, or activation of the senses in your skin before you can have pain. But remember, I mentioned in the other slide is that pain is also an emotional, uh, uh, unpleasant emotional uh, uh, sensation. So if you look at this picture, I'm sure some of you would feel pain, all right? But this is actually not true, all right? This is actually a makeup. Yeah, you can Google up this, this website, okay? 
So this is actually because of uh, Halloween. So somebody created a highly, you know, lifelike uh, uh, makeup of somebody actually stepping into a nail. And we know that this is painful because we may have known, we have, may have experienced this ourselves. We may have known somebody who experienced this, or we may have known somebody who told that, you know, I stepped on the nail, it's so painful, it's rusted, you know, and it's, so because of that, we actually learn that this may cause pain. If you were to show this to a, 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 a baby that's one or one year old who doesn't have a context to this picture, they will see it as just a picture, all right? So again, this is fake. This is just to highlight to you that pain is actually being learned. So pain relies on context, what you have seen before, maybe uh, what you have heard, what you have smelled, taste, or touch things that you can say or do, even thoughts or belief. You know, I believe that I have fell, I've fallen before, and therefore that may actually cause me pain in the future. And places that you go, you know, how many people know that I hate going to that place? It's just so painful. Or even people that are so painful in your life. So pain relies a lot on context and that we learn uh, pain as we go along in life. So I'm going to tell you a couple of um, amazing pain stories now. Just to highlight to you about, you know, the, 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 the interesting about pain, looking at it from a different way. So this is the story of a Chinese man who in 1994 was mugged in a bar and had a knife driven into his head. Okay, so a rusty knife was embedded in man's head for 26 years. Now, the reason for that is that no, he lives in a very far village away from town. Nobody at that village or any doctor who comes to the village could actually know how to remove. And in the year 2000, uh, sorry, 2010, through a simple surgery, the, the knife was removed. So imagine having a knife embedded in your head for about 26 years. Right? So does the, pen, does the man have pain? And how has he endured that in the last uh, 26 years? So that's amazing pain story number one. So I'm going to go to amazing pain number, sto uh, number two. Now, a construction worker, this came out actually in one of the uh, medical journals in, uh, in 1990, sorry, I think it's in 1995, you know, which uh, quite interesting because it related a, a story of a builder who jumped off a platform and landed squarely on a, although it described in the literature as a nail, this is more like a screw, okay, a very long screw. So he fell on a, on a screw, pierced through his safety boots, and imagine he's wearing a safety boot. This is where the steel cap toe is. The screw just missed that and went through. So the screw just went through his bone and he felt severe, intense pain. They called an ambulance. He was brought to the emergency department. They initially tried to pull the nail out. He was screaming in pain so bad that he needed to be sedated with strong medications that made him sleep and was given morphine as well. And when he was sedated and when they pulled out the screw and they removed his shoe, they did not find any injury as well. Okay, so in the first Amazing Pain story, here you have somebody with a knife in but managed to endure the pain for 26 years. And here you have a builder, a construction worker, who fell on that, who screamed so much pain, and but when you remove the, the, the screw, there was no injury as well. So what does this mean? So does pain and damage actually relate to each other? All right. Now, what about phantom limb pain? I'm, I'm sure you've heard of cases of people who have had amputations, but still complain of pain. So this is to highlight to you that pain actually arises from the brain, not the leg. And the answer, does pain and damage relate? Of course they don't. So this is closer to home. Uh, our own very own uh, Kirin cyclist, Azizul Hasni, back in, uh, I'm mistaken, it's 2012 in Manchester. He was uh, in the last, in the finals, and he fell, and he had a 20 centimeter splinter through his calf, but he got on his bicycle, continued to cycle, completed it, won the, the race, and you know, we, even with that in. So pain and tissue damage rarely relates to each other. So this means that even though you have 
very, very severe pain, it doesn't mean that your pain, your, your damage or your disease is very, very severe. A couple of days ago, I, I saw a man uh, who came to see me because of uh, a herniated disc pain that was radiating down his arm. He had a heart attack uh, about two years before. So we were talking, he was asking me, why is this nerve pain so painful? I said that pain uh, and when the damage, uh, you know, when the actual problem is just very, very little. So I took and, and, and I related him to his story about his heart attack. When he had his heart attack, he didn't know that all he had was just a little bit of chest discomfort. What made him go was that, you know, his, uh, his, his GP friend kept telling him, come, please come, let me get do an, an ECG. And that was when he was diagnosed to have a heart attack. So he had a heart attack despite not having much pain. But yet when he had a disc herniation, the pain was so intense. So he couldn't really understand why. So this is actually an opportunity for me to say that, you know, pain and tissue damage rarely relates to each other. So pain is again, normal and very, very protective. So pain, your pain system is actually trying to protect you from what are the other problems. Have you thought about people who do not have the ability to feel pain? Now, this is an interesting article by Ashlyn um, Blocker. She was born with what is called as congenital insensitivity to pain. So she does not feel pain. And this is her picture when she was small. And you can see that her hands are all bandaged up. Do you know why? Because she kept biting on her nails and her fingers. And that will cause injury to her fingers. And this is a picture of her in kindergarten. They really have to check in between her toes for any sand or stone because that may injure her. They have to look into her eyes to see whether there's any sand there because she can't feel pain. And if you read this article, she actually, a couple of times actually, you know, uh, over a hot soup, she just dipped her hand in to retrieve a fallen spoon without thinking, you know. So pain is normal and it is also serves to protect. And people who do not feel pain often die when they are young, you know, because they do silly things. So pain serves as a protector. But then again, pain can also be funny. So I'm just going to take an interlude here. Enjoy the video for the next 45 seconds. Can you hear the, the audio? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Okay. So is that painful? <laughs> it can be funny as well, isn't it? So this is actually from YouTube. So again, pain relies on context. So it's not to say that he doesn't feel pain. He feels pain. You can see how red his skin is after being hit. But yet, you know, this can also be funny. So the key thing that I'm going to try to say here, pain is always real. But then again, pain and damage rarely relates as with the amazing pain stories that I've to told you. Pain serves to protect, okay? So let's move on to the next thing. Now, a lot of people, that's okay. Now, a lot of, a lot of times when I see patients in clinic, you know, so they uh, start having back pain and they consult somebody or they consult their friend and they say that mm, you have back pain, it might be slip disc, all right? So we know slip disc don't exist. The disc doesn't slip in or out, okay? We know that from the anatomy. So. Coming back to the story again, so as the uh, maybe the, uh, uh, the the friend says you have slipped this, go and see someone. So go to see a doctor, and the doctor says that hmm, perhaps your back pain seems to be something unusual. So perhaps it was slipped this. Let's do a scan. Let's do an MRI. So when you do an MRI, oh, you have slipped this, and because you have slipped this, therefore you need surgery. So back pain is because of slipped this, slipped this. It's seen on the scan, and from the scan, you need surgery. So that gives surgeons a bad name. Uh, a bad name. So the truth about scans now, scans and MRI scans and x-rays are not pain scans. They are never made to, to show pain. What they basically show is 
uh, the, your insights. So x-rays and MRIs are basically a much more expensive form of taking a photo of your insights. Just like you take a photo of your outside, this is a method of taking a photo of your insight. So this is an MRI of the lower back of somebody whose age is about 30 years. So that's the tummy, that's the back. You can see bone, bone, and that's the cushion in between. The white thing is the spinal fluid. That's the gray thing is the spinal nerves. If you were to do an MRI scan in somebody who's 80 years old, again, that's the tummy, that's the back, bone, bone. And you can see that the cushions have all worn out. All right. Now, cushions wearing out are common. So there's a difference between somebody who is young and somebody who is old. A lot of times when I see patients with back pain who has had an MRI, I ask them this question. If you have back pain and you do an MRI and you find that there are changes seen on the MRI, does that mean that your pain is due to those changes in the MRI? What happens if you were to do an MRI in people who do not have pain? So there was a study that was published back in 2015, which showed changes in the MRI in people. These are not patients, these are people without back pain. So you can see the, the, the changes here as if you read uh, an MRI report, you know, this degeneration, this height loss, this bulge, annular fissure, or here in Malaysia, we call it annular tear, uh, spondylolisthesis, facet degeneration. Now let's look at this, this degeneration. I like to use this, um, you know, uh, this study as uh, to, to drive patient, uh, 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 the point to the patient that, you know, assuming that you take 10, 20 year olds who do not have back pain and you do an MRI, almost 40% of them will have some form of disc degeneration without pain. Okay. And the incidence get actually more by the time you're 30 is 50%, 40 is 70%, 50 is 80%. So basically, what I like to say is that this degeneration or changes on the MRI goes according to changes of time or your age. You know, some people say that, oh, this is aging. Although I like to say that this is more like kisses of time rather than aging. We all age. With age, there's only two possibilities. It's either that your age increases or your age stops. All right. So <laughs> you need to choose two possibilities. So you decide which is which. All right. So again, coming back to the MRI scans, the changes that you see on MRI are just basically like what I say, gray hair or wrinkles on your face. So if you look at your IC photo and look at your photo now, there's a lot of difference. If you do an MRI scan of the inside, there's a chance that it's going to be the same as well. So MRI changes can be normal. The, my role is actually to correlate your pain with the changes of the MRI. Uh, and most of the time, it doesn't seem to correlate. So the natural history of low back pain is actually very, very, very good. This is a study that was done you know, way back in the 70s. Even then, it shows that you know, natural history of low back pain, they all improve, although a small percentage actually resolve over time. Looking at something closer to home, this was a, a study that was conducted in a host, district hospital uh, in Malaysia about healthcare workers. So imagine healthcare workers. So you have uh, doctors, physios, nurses, you know, uh, medical attendants, uh, orderlies, right? So they were all interviewed and about recovery of back pain. And you can see that majority of them, 81% of them recovers uh, in less than three weeks. Now, what is interesting is that even though they are working in a hospital, only 34% of the total Three, almost 300 people actually went for treatment. And those who went for treatment, if you look below, most of them actually chose to do traditional treatment. So you can work in a hospital, but if you believe in traditional treatment, you will still go for traditional treatment. Right? Maybe it's got something to, to do with slip disc scans you know, and surgery. Uh, that's the bad name that's been given. So, so I'm just going to um, uh, uh, limit my talk to two of the most con common conditions that I see, back sprains and strains. This is commonly occur, you know, what people say is lifting improperly or you're not fit to uh, lift. You make sudden movements, you know, so you've been sitting all whole day and then suddenly uh, wife says that, can you lift this gas uh, tank? It's already run out. So you just pull and that causes pain. You can, uh, it can also be caused because, uh, it can also be caused by a fall uh, or sometimes poor posture. Okay, excess body weight and heavy handbag. I'm not too sure about that, okay. 
Common features of people with back strains and back pain is that they are sedentary. This is an old slide. You can see the computer is now desktop. Now the computer is with us with the phone. So I'm yet to see there's another one uh, picture there. So we are all sedentary. We moved on from being a hunter to a gatherer to a uh, farmer to an industrial worker. Now we are all at the computer and not only at the office, the house now becomes uh, uh, the office because of COVID. And the other common feature is that not exercising and not taking care of the weight. So the good thing about, uh, sorry, forgot about this. So this is just a video to highlight to you about, you know, how sometimes you just lift and, you know, with a proper uh, body mechanics and that can result to a sprain. A sprain occurs when the joint moves more than what it is accustomed to. So you can sprain by just moving just a little bit if you're not accustomed to that, that movement. The good thing about strains and sprains, it will settle. So with a bit of ice pack, a bit of stretches, a bit of medications, anti-inflammatories mostly, not painkillers. There's a lot of misconception about medications. For example, things like Voltaren, Ponstan, Celebrex, Acoxia, the newer ones, these are all anti-inflammatories. So when you have a sprain, you have an, you have an injury, and the injury results in an inflammation. Most of the time, some anti-inflammatories, even Panadol, will help. So it will settle within less than three weeks. So that's one. Now, the second thing about the slip disc slip up. Okay, now I told you already about slip disc. The proper term here is actually a herniated disc. It's pain that you have that radiates from your bottom down to your feet. And it is because of the cushion which has torn, okay, and it irritates the nerve root. The, the video next will actually highlight this much better. Okay, so Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm just going to hide it. Okay. Imagine that this is a cross section. All right. Your tummy is down at the bottom of your screen. Your back is above your screen. Okay. So that's the cushion, the disc. That's the nucleus. I call it the jelly. That's the annulus. I call it the donut. That's the nerve. All right. And that's bone. Okay. So as we age, the cushion gets a little bit more brittle. And what happens is that sometimes it tears and this results in a herniation and it goes to the area of the nerve. And what happens is that nerves have got a lot of sensors on them because they are important and they will be very, very angry. So they get, they get inflamed. So this is the cushion. And what happens is that the cushion tears and it irritates the nerve. And what you get is pain that runs down your leg or in a particular nerve distribution. So there are many treatments available for herniated disc. Mainstay of the treatment is actually medications, all right, and also physiotherapy and movement. And there are various other options for treating a herniated disc, which is which does not seem to heal. Yes, herniated disc does heal. Now, I'm going to highlight to you another, another amazing pain story, just to illustrate to you that herniated disc will heal. We're going to go back into the, uh, uh, the, the concepts that I've taught you before. So I had a 27-year-old lady who came to see me because of, uh, for a second opinion. So she had numbness. She calls, the, uh, she uses the word kabas down her, uh, her left leg. So she had numbness for about, uh, about a week. She finds it difficult to walk. Getting out of bed is difficult. So when the, 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 the surgeon examined her, oh, sounds like a slip disc, you need a scan. So they did a scan. So when they did a scan and what they found, okay, this is an MRI scan. So that's the tummy, that's the back, that's the bottom, bone, bone, that's the cushion in between. Can you see that? All right, that's the disc which has herniated out and it's pressing on the nerve on the left side. So whenever you, so somebody, so remember that story, back pain, slip disc, do, an, do a scan, confirms the slip disc, then you need surgery. So the surgeon, of course, very well versed in surgery, recommended that she undergo surgery. But she said, no thanks, this is just kabas. You know, this is just numbness. So she came to see me, um, sort of, oh, you have nerve irritation. Instead of uh, using the word slip disc, I used to say nerve irritation. This is something very temporary, gave her some medications. She did physio, taught her how to move. She got better and everything was fine. Now, this MRI was taken in April 2014, right? Four months down the line, she was very well. She was having a shower. She slipped and she fell. She had severe back pain. 
And it, it was so excruciating that her husband had to call the ambulance. She was brought to the hospital where they looked back at her notes and they said that, oh, you had slipped this four week, four months ago. So let's do another MRI scan. So they did the MRI scan and this is the MRI in August. Look at what happened to that disc, all right? So she fell, she had severe pain, but the disc is now gone. So what does that mean? You know, so it, it implied again to where what I taught you earlier on that pain and damage rarely actually correlate. They, re, they don't relate to each other. Here, patient complained a bit of kabas down her leg, all right? But yet when you see the MRI, it looks like it's so big, all right? But yet four months later when she fell, she had severe pain. And what you see here is that the disc is already resolved. So this proves that disc herniations are temporary goes back again to my point that you know most back pain will resolve within a few weeks or it may take a little bit of time and that you know surgery is for those whose disc doesn't seem to resolve over time so in conclusion like i mentioned before the spine is a super stable structure that never ever slips please don't use the term slip this anymore all right it's like the spine doesn't slip the severity of, of Pain does not imply that the worse the injury or disease. So the greater the pain doesn't mean that the worse the injury is, the lesser the pain, the lesser the injury. They do not correlate. Changes in MRI in people without back pain can also be found in people with back pain. Right? So it needs to be interpreted very, very carefully. Nearly all back pain with, will resolve within two to three weeks. So with that, thank you so much for listening to my uh, to my conversation or my talk. Uh, I look forward to questions. I shall Thank stop you. sharing the screen Thank now. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. All right. Doctor, um, I am very interested to uh, know that uh, sleep this is actually the wrong terminology, and uh, right, that is uh, used by so many people. In fact, my husband has been diagnosed with sleep this. And, um, <laughs> but with uh, physiotherapy and with exercise, and he was told not to gain any weight that to maintain his uh, condition now. That yeah. sounds easier than can be done, you know, not to gain any weight with the COVID situation. It's not easy. I, I, I think, you know, sometimes in, in, um, uh, when we're trying to, to help people, we sometimes come up with solutions which is not quite, you know, convenient. How not to put on weight? <laughs> Okay. Before this, you know, you need to go to the mama store. I used to, whenever I started giving lectures, you know, I used to tell that, oh, there's always a mama stall within one kilometer of your house. And it's worse if you're in Penang, it's within 500 meters, you know, so there's always a mama stall. So food is so easy. Now it's even worse. All you have to do is just a couple of presses on the phone and the grab or whatever your, 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 your motorcycle rider will come and bring whatever that you want. And so you have uh you know uh, uh, your fingers so again you know uh, to me i always uh, look at uh, from a pragmatic point of view what is simple what is achievable by the person the other thing similarly amy um a lot of times i hear that you know people always say that you know swimming is very good i'm sure you've heard of that mm. for back pain yes swimming right. is very good i'm sure some of uh, the participants okay but do you realize that how difficult it is to have access to a pool Okay. Yeah, Not only that, if you have access to a pool, then shop. you need to have yes. If you have condo or club, all right, then you need the proper attire for the swimming, all right, and you need to know how to swim. And now with the COVID environment, you can't swim. So actually, the, the thing that is to me most important is movement. Any form of movement. If you like walking, walking is good. If you like running, running is good. Cycling, whatever, playing with your kids, you know, playing with the dog, whatever sort of movement. Because do you know what is the most important uh, uh, rule of the body? The most important rule. Okay, I want everybody to remember this. The most important rule is called use it, move it, or lose it. Okay, move it, use it, or lose it. Same thing with the brain as well. So if you yeah. don't use your brain, you're going to lose <laughs> your brain. Okay, so Move it, use it, or lose it. All right. That applies to all uh, muscles. That Everything. Have, right? yes. Okay. The, the very last slide that you showed before you concluded mm. your uh, sharing was that uh, the lady who came to you complained that initially she had kabas, mm. which is like numbness. Then she had a fall. In fact, his, her, her knitted disc was resolved. 
but she had even more severe pain. Okay. That could be a different injury that's not no, related to um, Remember, I, I mentioned in one of my slides that pain is related, relies on context. Okay. What I didn't mention was that, you know, when she fell, I'm sure automatically your brain will relate back again, you know, that words that the surgeon told her, you need surgery, you know, or maybe people will say, oh, you had sleep this, don't fall. Okay. How are you going to say that? Don't fall. Okay. Because you're not going to know when you're going to fall. Right. So when she fell, she had severe pain and then the pain is actually being compounded by the fact that, you know, she might thought that she might have surgery and she has surgery, how long is she going to be away from work, you know, what sort of problems are going to, is going to take care of my kids, going to take care of the husband, you know, a lot of things. And so a lot of things are actually going on in your brain at that time, right? Okay, so it's, it's a little bit like um, the pain that she put it to herself pain. is in her mind. Correct, it's we learn about pain, the context of pain. So... If you diffuse, if you actually, you know, uh, understand all that, you can actually diffuse the, the, the pain at that level. Okay, so that's more of like um, coping. If you understand better, you'll be able to cope well Correct. with uh, the pain. So that's why. But like you mentioned, usually it resolves within two to three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the questions. Okay. We have so many questions coming up in the chat box, but let's uh, answer the question in the uh, registration form first. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have one of our guests ask, uh, I have constant back pain after squatting. Any solution, doctor? Okay. The most uh, important, uh, the most common thing uh, is they will always say don't squat. Oh, I thought squat is a very is a very okay. good exercise. No. no, squatting is a good exercise. But then, if squatting causes pain, I actually need to know in, in, in a greater detail what does it what does the person mean actually when they have pain and they squat. Now, uh, the pain is just pain is actually trying to tell you something. You have to understand to make out what what is trying to tell you. So, are you doing too many squats? So, for one of the things that I I, I get this a lot in in the clinic. So, I, patients tell me that oh, whenever I squat, I get pain. Or so I ask them again, how many uh, squats do you do? Or they will say that oh, I do ten squats and I get pain. So. I say that start low and go slow. Maybe do two squats and then slowly, you know, after a few days, go to three. After a few days, go to four. So that's one. Uh, another group would tell me that, you know, I, uh, I can't squat at all. I, every time I try to squat, I get pain. So I tell them, do it gradually first. Go down a little bit and come up again. Go down, you know, work your way down. If you want to squat, work your, start a little bit and work your way up as you go. So the solution is to start low and go slow. Not low in terms of the squat, but low in terms of the, the distance of the squat or the, the, the number, the frequency of the squats. So start low. It's not that you can't do it. So remember again that rule of move it, use it, or lose it. You know, so if you, you, you stop squatting, you will lose the ability to squat. Okay, so do it gradually. Yes. Don't go to the extreme end no, from and the very slow. beginning. Yeah. Doctor, what are the exercises to reduce recurrence of back pain? Okay, movement. <laughs> All right. There are actually a lot of exercises uh, on the internet that, uh, you know, that you can pick and choose. You know? But for me, um, I always tell my patients that you know, any form of exercise is good as long as you follow these three simple S rules. Okay? Just like COVID, three S. Uh, sempit, sembang, and what's the other S? Uh, some pits and I'll forget, forget it. Okay, okay, I, I can't, it can't, doesn't come to my mind. Sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> uh, okay, so my three S is actually suka, selesa, and sikit, sikit. All right, suka, selesa, sikit, sikit. So, any form of exercise, the problem is that when you look at YouTube or any of the apps for the exercises, people have been doing these exercises are very, very well versed with this exercise. You are just starting out, so you need to start up again. Start low, make sure you're happy when you're doing it, make sure you're enjoying it, then you work your way up. So you start off with your favorite, simple to do, can do stretches. Okay. Okay, so uh, start something, as long as you are moving, that's the right thing, whether Little you're walking, yeah. Yeah. okay, yeah. or stretching, yeah. all right, uh, it's actually move it, Con uh, continuously just keep on moving that's the key thing and I think during this um, pandemic we are all stuck at home it's actually harder for a lot of people to move because the temptation to just sit down and yeah. lay and back you know it's Netflix. so high yeah so what uh, I encourage you know everybody 
um, to stand up, you know, if you're watching the TV, you know, move around, pace around instead of sitting down all the time. Okay, uh, next question we have is, uh, I am a breast cancer survivor, completed my treatment uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and now under thermosiphon medication. I always feel okay. pain in my backbone. I'm really worried about spraying the cell cancer. What should I do to relieve the pain? And what can cause lower back pain in a woman's? Um, and what's the, what's the treatment? Yep. Yeah. Now, uh, if... Uh, okay. Since you're a cancer survivor, I'm sure your your your, um, your oncologist would have done all the screening and all that. It sounds like you've completed the treatment and that you're on the, the right treatment for uh, breast cancer, which is tamoxifen. Now, um, the best thing for you to do is to talk to your oncologist to say that you have back pain and they can actually, uh, you know, screen if there were any, uh, the worst thing that what we are, all, uh, we are commonly afraid of is actually whether there is any spread to the spine. Uh, so that's basically what we call a red flag. So uh, there are times when, you know, when a patient comes to see me with previous history of uh, 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 breast cancer or previous history of cancer, and the patient complains of back pain. One of the indicators that tells me whether this could be spread to the spine is pain, which is at night uh, uh, and unrelenting pain. Not usual painkillers doesn't seem to help, or pain medications don't seem to help. So the best thing to ascertain is to talk to your oncologist. Maybe you know he or she will actually uh, uh, do a scan or do a, 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 a what do you call that a, a bone scan? Yeah, uh, to actually ascertain whether there's any spread to the spine, and with that you need a referral to the uh, Surgeon. If everything is normal, perhaps it could just be a different thing. You know, most of the common things that I see in patients, uh, even without a uh, history of cancer, is that their joints are stiff. You know, uh, as you know, because of the sedentary lifestyle, and they actually have a sprain that recurs over and over again. So again, trying to ascertain what is the cause of the pain, understanding it, and knowing what to do to help reduce the pain is very, very important. This is all very, very general. I hope that answer uh, the question by our guest today. Speak to your uh, oncologist. The next question that we have is, um, is back pain one of the signs of kidney problem or failure? No. Remember pain and damage right? really relate. Uh, you can see a lot of patients with kidney They don't have, uh, you know, kidney, uh, back pain. So uh, what do you call that? Uh, yeah, kidney stones are one of the uh, causes of back pain, uh, again, that can be investigated and can be treated. So um, I know a lot of, I get asked this a lot as well, you know, patients are all wondering that back pain keeps recurring and they come and ask me, you know, when I should have a kidney test, you know, but again, the kidney is an organ which is, you know, related more towards the tummy rather than the back. So it may cause, uh, it, uh, rarely it causes pain, but most of the time, any kidney diseases, they are actually asymptomatic, right? So it is not a good indicator. Okay, so it's not a good indicator, but if let's say uh, that person has a concern, you know, he or she should go and uh, do for yeah. the testing or screening yep. related with kidney, yep. kidney related. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, another guest written, uh, I have terri very terrible back pain, mostly when the time to sleep. It feels so pain, but by the morning I wake up, time to wake up, that's uh, not so pain. How to manage or what should I do to relieve my pain? Okay. Um that sort of complaint is very common, especially in somebody who is 40, 50 years old. This is what we call an inflammatory pain. So that, that pain, again, it's not an indicator of uh, damage. It may be a bit of inflammation, it may be a little bit of, uh, you know, sometimes you overdo, try to do too many things. And a lot of patients with that sort of complaint actually finds that it is much more painful uh, uh, when they are a bit more active during the day. So what happens is that when you wake up, you feel a bit stiff and there is a little bit of inflammation that occurs in the joints. So uh, a lot of times I tell patients to either put a hot pack or an ice pack at the back, you know, do a bit of stretches. And most of the time it will go away after a couple of days. And if it doesn't, maybe perhaps a simple uh, thing like Panadol or sometimes an anti-inflammatory may sometimes help with some stretches. But if this person is having recurrent okay. pain, even after moving and stretching, yeah, would then be you come causing? back and then we'll have a look. Because sometimes there are certain uh, stretches that can that can be taught that can actually help to, to reduce the, the pain. Okay, And a lot of times that happens when the joints are a bit stiff. Okay. Right. So the, the joint stiff is 
is the main reason of okay. most back pain. Yeah. Would you say so? Because of lack of movement, lack of mm -hmm. muscle movement. Yeah. Uh, what I didn't highlight that's... Uh, on my lecture is that you know joints are basically two bones which is rubbing against each other. Uh, all right. So when you have two bones rubbing against each other, each other, what do you need in between to make it move better? You need some form of lubricant or oil, isn't it? Okay. All right. So. Do you know that the body will only produce lubricant for your joints if you move? So there are a lot of times, I'm sure you can relate to this, if you sit in a car for a long time or you sit in one of the Zoom meetings for a long time, and when you get up, you feel pain. But the moment you start walking, the pain eases off. So this is when the body starts producing lubricant. So again, back to movement again. Movement is important. Yeah, I think cannot stress enough that movement is so important to prevent mm. or, or relieve uh, back pain. And this brings to the next question. Can back pain linger for years? Can. Uh, that is what we call persistent pain uh, syndrome, uh, persistent back pain. Uh, again, pain, uh, what I highlighted to you earlier on was that the greater the pain does not mean that the greater the injury is. The same thing again, the longer the pain does not mean that the, the Injury is, the injury is getting worse. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I had this uh, engineer who kept having an MRI. So he came to see me with you know, a stack of like that MRI films. You know, he's been doing MRIs for the last five years and he says that the pain is still there, but my MRIs are not changing. Why is it happening? Why, what's going on? You know? so, so he's, because, and when I asked him further is that he's a piping engineer. So he used to do x-rays and ultrasounds for all these pipes to actually anticipate if there's a failure of the pipe. So he's losing that, that, that principle on to himself again. So it does not imply that you know, the longer the duration of pain or the recurrence of pain, that the worse of the condition would be. The other thing is that uh, another thing which I frequently encounter in my, in my practice is people come and, uh, you know, with the belief that, oh, I fell off a motorbike three, four years ago, everything was well then, now I'm having pain, it's because of that fall. Falls do not accumulate and cause you problems later on in life, it doesn't. All right? If there's any problems, it will cause problems, uh, it will, if there's any damage, it will cause problems there and then, rather than accumulate and you know, uh, get worse in the future. So that's, again, is a misinformation. Mis, uh, Okay, but uh, if let's say a fall happen, if it's a muscle tear or a ligament tear, it yeah. would cause long term no, to be a different. No, no, no. Okay, now um, I I don't I don't agree to that. Uh, let let me highlight to you this. Okay, uh, is it muscle? All right, if you fall, uh, does it? Okay, now the best way to look at you know to relate and how muscle injury is is our tongue. All right. Our tongue is all made of muscle. Now, I'm sure everybody would have done this. You have bitten your tongue. How many days does it take to heal? It heals within a while, okay, in a couple of days. And I'm sure those of you who follow, you know, football or any sports of your choice, you've had your, you know, your athlete suffer a hamstring pull or a muscle injury. They're out of play for about three or four weeks, then they go back. So it takes to heal muscle injury. Uh, for muscle to cause pain, you have to injure it. Right, so you can injure it by doing something silly or doing things, sports, you know, overdoing, you know, whatever, and it will heal on its own within the next three to two, four weeks at least. All right, so so again, uh, hope you can hear me well. Hello. Yes, I can hear right? you. I okay. can hear you well. Yes. I just got a message that uh, internet connection is unstable. So. Uh, again, muscles do not cause pain unless if you injure it. Okay. Uh, the long no, the other thing is that bone even if you fracture your back all right it takes six weeks to a maximum of about two months to or three months for it to heal all right so healing still takes place and most simple spine fractures get better within six weeks all right so again uh the duration does not actually imply the cause of the injury Okay, it's very interesting to, to know that to know that today after uh, knowing that uh, people that I know that have pain, they've been telling me they have pain for years. Mm -hmm. It could be knee pain, could be back pain especially. Yeah, but I think it's because of lack of movement, probably mm -hmm. those one of the yeah. reasons. Okay, um, doctor, what? Okay, I'm diagnosed with grade 1 enterolithosis with L4 over L5 vertebra in 2020 and osteopenia in 2019. Can I take up diving and hiking? The, the ones that you describe is actually, okay, two things here. Enterolysis, that's a very fancy word to say that your bone has slipped forward. And 
Remember what I mentioned earlier on about MRI scans and pain. So I'm sure you had a back pain and you had an X-ray or an MRI, and suddenly they're on the report that says that enterolis, this is fancy word. Right? What it means is that bone has slipped forward. Again, the question here is that uh, does your pain is uh, caused by that finding? You know, because a lot of patients have got all this listhesis movement, you know, forward movement of the spine, but yet they don't have pain. So to me, it is what, of what we call a non-specific change, which is not related to your complaint. So that's one. The second thing is osteopenia. Osteopenia relates to, uh, and I hope that the diagnosis of osteopenia was done based on a bone scan, a bone density scan rather than an x-ray. Right? So osteopenia here refers to the quality, the, the amount of calcium that you have in your bone. So if the amount of calcium is less, they call it osteopenia. If the amount of calcium is way lower, we call it osteoporosis. Now, calcium is actually, uh, the, the, the bone density is actually dependent on, uh, it, I always like to think of it like EPF. You start putting money into your EPF when you start working. So you start depositing calcium as you grow, okay, as you age, all right? By the time you reach 40, you start to plateau uh, in terms of your, uh, you know, uh, your, your contribution to EPF. And by the time you reach, you know, 55, you start to withdraw. So it's the same thing again, you know, so bone accumulates over time. By the time 40 years old, then you start to plateau off. And by the time in ladies, when they reach menopause, they withdraw a lot. So if you're, to start off, your savings are low, then you're, you may get osteopenia. So to hit two things, so, so two questions here, enterolysis and osteopenia. To me, enterolysis doesn't mean anything, all right? Uh, uh, it, it's just a, a, a finding on the X-ray or on the MRI. Osteopenia can be improved with, not just taking calcium, but with exercises, with movement, with diet, any weight-bearing movement, all right, um, which what happens here is this bone is actually being produced according to your function. So if you're sedentary, you sit all the time, you compare that to somebody of the same age who moves a lot, who exercises, the person who moves a lot, who exercises will have far more bone than the one who is sedentary. So uh, again, you know, bone forms according to function. So in order for you to overcome that osteopenia, please take calcium if you are at the age, uh, uh, you know, it's recommended, all right, and exercise. All right, and that will actually help improve the osteopenia. And for you to so, do diving, actually, you need to see somebody who is actually, uh, who, uh, you know, doing this over a, a Zoom meeting is very difficult because I do not see you and, you know, I need to actually examine and understand where your pain comes from, from the, you know, before, you know, everything matters when it comes to pain. I need to actually weigh out all the, uh, the, the things that you, know, that you have learned before and what are, are your concepts about pain and how we can undo them and get you to be better. Okay. So to our guests who ask the question, whether uh, are you okay to take up diving or hiking, I think best is here, doctor. Uh, hiking and maybe, but diving doctor, is a bit more... Uh, a, a, a bit more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, doctor, so what type of sitting it, position... Sitting position, would you suggest for a student or someone who have to sit in a long hours uh, in front of the computer or doing assignments? Okay. Now, sitting position, I, I don't know any position that you feel comfortable. Okay. Now, we have people who say that, you know, uh, ergonomic, uh, there are some organizations who actually employ ergonomic people to actually observe and, you know, recommend proper sitting positions. So they, 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 they actually stress on proper posture, okay, to actually sit better, so the position of your uh, computer and all that. But I'm also more pro movement. Remember what I mentioned that joints actually need lubricants, you know. So to me, if you sit, please remember to move. How you sit to me is up to you, whatever is comfortable for you, you know. To change the way that you sit by telling you how to sit is sometimes very, very difficult because we are doing some things which we are not. Uh, we are not happy to do. So coming back to my sukkas, lesser, sikit, sikit, all right? So if you are happy to sit like that, you sit, but do movements as well. Remember that, you know, your joints need lubricant, right? Okay. So the idea is uh, to move, perhaps uh, to stand up, you know, every at least a few minutes in every uh, hour. A few minutes, maybe yeah. half an hour. It depends from person to person. You know, uh, uh, for me, you know, it's like every 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I get up, I stretch, all right? 
and I move a little bit. Okay, so so it depends. You can't have a proper, you know, say that oh, ten minutes you have to move or half an hour because some people have can can sit for about an hour or two hours before they need to move. So it all depends on how how you are. Yeah. Okay, so movement once again, movement, everybody. Okay, so now let's move on to our uh, question in the chat box. Okay, actually we have about 14 to 15 questions, doctor. I uh, hope you can answer the whole of them. We try to go through as fast as we can. Uh, so to the rest who have questions, please uh, feel free to put it back in and to the chat box. Uh, the first question that was asked earlier before doctor started was uh, this person said that uh, I was having frequent asthma attacks for the past two years. I was admitted to hospital for monthly for the attacks. I was given hydrocortisone jabs always. Will it affect my bones? Okay. My reply is strong bones. Okay. <laughs> now, um, uh, hydrocortisone injections are actually uh, very, very safe. Uh, the ones that are bad for the bone is actually oral steroids, not injectable steroids. So if you're taking oral steroids over a long period of time, they can actually cause osteoporosis. So if you have asthma, because the problem of asthma is actually inflammation, so you need steroid to actually reduce the inflammation. So, so you'll find that they will give you a hydrocortisone injection, then after that, they will follow with a bit of prednisolone for a few days, then they will stop. So they are not, you are not being put on long-term steroids. So it is still very, very safe. So it will not affect your, your, uh, your, your bones at, at, at all. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, next question, how do we ascertain the back pain is from injured ligament, nerves, or muscles, or ETC? We, we don't need to. Now, I've mentioned that most back pain will actually heal within three weeks. Okay, so if you fall, uh, you know, unless, of course, I think that there is a fracture, the, the reason for me to do an x-ray is that just to confirm whether you have a fracture and to tell you that, oh, it will get better within the next four to six weeks. You can actually tell you what's going on. So even if you fall, the thing here is that you can move, all right? Uh, continue to move, put some eyes, all right? So we do not actually need to ascertain what is the cause. You fall, so you have pain, then you move, all right? All right, it's good to know because I know some people who are really paranoid and they really want to find out the core reason. Yeah, so remember again, pain. you know, the greater the pain does not mean that the, 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 the worse the injury, all right? Or, or the longer the duration of pain, yeah, it's more damaged to it. Right. Okay. Doctor, what causes herniated disc? No cause. <laughs> okay, it just happens. <laughs> All right. Um, I know there are uh, certain doctors, uh, I used to be like that. I used to say that if lifting and all that, but over the years, what I found out and then what the, the literature seems to suggest is, is actually part and parcel of a process of what we call degeneration or aging. All right. As we age, the, the cushion gets, just like your cushion, it gets a little bit more hard, it will tear, you know, it will subside, and that happens. And, and my, my answer to what causes a herniated disc is always another question. Uh, why do you get pimples? Okay, <laughs> you're doing it, okay. Same thing again. Uh, so, so like these herniations to me are just like a pimple. You know, they, you, uh, how do people, so, so patients, ask, whenever I show them that, you know, the MRI that I showed you, okay. So, I, so they ask me, how did this disappear? I said, how do pimples disappear? Your body resolves it, okay? So it just happens. And the thing that you, want, you, you must understand is that it is actually a temporary condition. It will all heal. Although it may take a bit of time in some patients, some heal faster, some takes a little bit more time, but everybody will get better at the end of it. Okay. And once again, the way to prevent it is through movement. Yep. Yeah. Yep, okay. And, and yes. it's because it's safe for you to move, all right? Right, okay. Can you explain what is lumbar spondylosis? Okay. Spondylosis, that's another favorite term that I get in the clinic. Okay, um, I, I look at it this way. Spondylosis is a fancy term to say that you're getting old. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, spondylosis, actually, it's a term used by radiologists. So when you go and have an x-ray, they look at your spine, if they see some changes, maybe, you know, there's a little bit of bone at the ends, you know, and they will call this as spondylosis. And to me, spondylosis is, again, very much like the, the wrinkles on your face, the gray hair in your head, right? It's just changes of time. And spondylosis can be present in people who do not have back pain. My, my turning point for spondylosis uh, was actually almost 10 years ago when I saw a 14-year-old girl with neck pain had an x-ray and it was commented as cervical spondylosis and I said like this is not 
right? Okay, and parents were very worried. So I, I don't think it is uh, something which is significant. It's just what we call a radiological description to say that you, your spine has a little bit of gray hair in that sense. Okay. So don't be too, too worried about the term spondylosis. Uh, we all have spondylosis at one time or the other. Okay, so just now you mentioned about the younger age, 14 years old, with her, which has a, a spondylosis, but yeah. um, there are so many terms like, you know, text neck, where children nowadays are stick to their screen, whether it's a phone yeah. or a, uh, a tab or an iPad, they are constantly looking down. Would this also cause uh, a problem in the future? Um, not with the spondylosis, but with pain, yes, because of the lack of movement. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so the key, even if you are looking at the screen for a long time, is to get up and move regularly. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, next question we have, a fall and hit to the backbone, uh, it has visual bruise and ache without X-ray or MRI. How do I know the ache is due to the injury of the muscle or nerve? Okay. Now, again, uh, almost similar to what I was before, how do we certain back pains from an injured ligament or not? We do not need to know, okay? But if you look, uh, if you remember the, from the lecture that I told you, that the spine is actually a very, very super stable structure. You know, you've got a lot of muscles, you've got a lot of bone in between, you've got ligaments to hold it. So it takes a lot to actually injure the spine, right? And usually it's actually a high energy injury, a fall from a high, you know, or a, 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 you know, a high speed accident. Those things can cause uh, injury. All right, so uh, usually I will only do an x-ray if I have a high index of a fracture. MRI, if I think that there is a nerve injury that I need to do something, which means that I need to do an, a surgery to stabilize the fracture or, you know, those kind of things. So I need help now. The other way to look at x-rays and MRIs is like this. Uh, we are all familiar with ways, okay? And do you still remember the GPS, Garmin, you know? Yes. Okay. The uh, MRIs and X-rays are just like the GPS machine. It just tells you how to get there, but it doesn't tell you what happens along the way, unlike Waze or Google Maps nowadays, right? So again, the, the context of the problem needs to be interpreted with the images. So sometimes uh, I tend to be a bit more simple. Uh, I, I don't do images unless they are absolutely necessary. And it changes the way that I treat the patient. So if I'm suspecting something, which is not right. Like, for example, if you have back pain, you have previous history of cancer. And when I examine, you know, there's a bit of deformity in the spine. I need to do an MRI just to make sure that yeah, I'm not, you know, missing out the possibility of a spread of cancer. Okay. All right. So um, it's not important to know or ascertain what's the reason. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because it will surely get well uh, after a while. Uh, doctor, next question. Regarding injury to the tailbone of a 20 months old toddler, will it affect his walking abilities? Uh, number one, okay, I find this question very, very unusual. Um, I, I'm not sure what the name, the term tailbone here actually refers to. If it refers to the sacrum, uh, it could be something else because uh, the tailbone, the coccyx, it's not seen in a toddler. It only gets ossified much later in life, okay, when they are actually in about 12 or 9 years old, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so in a 20 year old toddler, you will not be able to see the coccyx, that's one. Number two is that coccyx does not take part in walking. So there's no, I'm not sure. I've never diagnosed a coccyx injury in a 20 month old, although I've seen a 20 year old with coccyx injury that's something regular. So I find that question very, very unusual. I, I guess uh, if uh, the person's asking that could be a child having a, diff a walking disabilities or walking uh, difficulties, no. would it be related to the spine? Um, it can be, but rarely it is. Is it is possible if you look at it, but it's extremely rare. Uh, most of the time, some uh, the problem can arise from the hip joints or from the knee joints, uh, okay, or even from the position of the even that also again is rare. Now, injury children are basically made of rubber. If you think of it that way, okay, they 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 can actually so, uh, they can actually withstand a lot more uh, hit than what an adult would be able to. So, very rarely do injuries actually cause problems walking. Now, one of the problems that 20 month old toddler will be walking like a toddler's gait and, you know, they will always get up and fall, get up and fall, get up and fall. And some people might think that frequent falls will actually cause problems to them. No, it will not. So not to worry, okay, for a toddler because they are really like rubber. 
Okay, next question. Uh, sometimes a sudden sneeze causes back pain. Why? How to get rid of this pain? All right. That means that your joints are stiff. Whenever you sneeze, you have to move the joints. And if your joints have been stiff, you sneeze, you sprain your joints, and that causes pain. How to get rid of the pain? Before you sneeze, you better stretch. No, <laughs> just joking. So if you sneeze, you get back pain. Uh, put some eyes there, move you know, a little bit. It should be fine. It will yes. be fine. Yeah. That's so why I think um, I've learned from this to this talk is that movement is really the ultimate to make sure that, you know, our body to reduce pain in our body. Right. Doctor, what is the role of chiropractor in management of back pain? Uh, they have a role. They help to loosen up the joints, which is stiff. Okay, But the thing about chiros that I don't quite like is that sometimes they order MRIs and unnecessarily, and that may end up, you know, scaring the patient. And the other thing is that they, they, they rely on, you know, you coming back every once in a while for a tune-up. So they think of you like a car. So to me, uh, I would be more like to empower the patient. I, I suppose it's their business model. So they want you to come back uh, for, uh, for you know, just like a haircut, uh, you know, whatever is far, you know, those kind of things. All right. So, but I'm more like empowering you because to me, the best treatment for back pain is self-care. Understanding what your pain means, understanding what you need to do to actually help to uh, reduce your pain. Okay, uh, the next question, Doctor, you have, you have answered earlier. Uh, the question is, uh, I have been having back pain for years due to degeneration of spine, according to doctor. I also have mild scoliosis. He advised me to swim, which I could not do so due to the pandemic. What is the advice to treat the pain? Okay, we spoke about so, swimming before already, you know. So to me, the best advice is, again, is movement. Any sort of exercise that you enjoy, that you like to do, then you, you do them. Again, same thing again. Start low, go slow. Okay, so get up, move, move a lot, do some stretching. Even this pandemic, move around the house. I think that would help to reduce the back pain. Uh, next question. Sometimes when I stretch my abdomen to the side, I hear crack crack sound from the spine. Is this a concern? This I think is many of us have concern. that. This is just like you cracking your knuckles. We have joints in our knuckles. We have joints in our spine. The homework for that person is actually to go to YouTube and type out why do your knuckles crack. Find a TED talk by Eleanor Nelson. It's a five-minute talk. Very interesting. It's actually an animated uh, talk. It tells you why your joints crack. And it is not because the joints are hitting each other. It is because of nitrogen bubbles. And nitrogen bubbles are being produced when your joints are stiff. Okay, so Google up why do our why do your knuckles crack? It's a talk by Eleanor Nelson. It's a TED talk. You look it up. It's very interesting. Okay, TED talk. So later we'll go and look for it after after today today's talk. Um, standing too long washing dishes causing back pain. Is it due to old age? Because no, again, because of nobody likes to do dishes. <laughs> Yes. Okay. okay, so move more, do more stretching before. No, you do. the way to do it is don't wait until your dishes accumulate. Do a little bit of the at a time. You know, I always like to give the example of when we travel along the north south hi highway. So from KL, you want to go to Bukit Kayu Time. Are you going to drive all the way? Why why is there a lot of R and Rs along the way? Because they want you to rest. <laughs> okay. So that's the point. Don't wait until your dishes accumulate. Do a little bit at a time, what is manageable. Okay. Uh, would sleeping on an uneven mattress cause back pain? It, it and how about coconut husk mattress? Especially if you don't like that mattress. <laughs> Nobody sleeps on a coconut husk mattress. Okay, I can tell you this story. I had a patient once who actually slept on a mattress which is 20,000 ringgit. Okay, I was wondering whether his mattress is actually stained, you know, I mean, lined with Swarovski crystals, still had bad pain. So again, you know, pain relies on context. You know, if you find that the, the mattress is not right, but it's not always because of the mattress, right? And the reason for this is because we, what we think is the mattress is that when we wake up, we get that pain. So actually the pain is because of what we did the day, right? Okay, so it's what we did before, that's why the pain actually, that we felt yeah, the next day. So that's we wake up the next day, all right? Okay, so it's important to, um, to be aware of your body, I guess. So we can find out better. Um, this next question: Unable to get up easily and need help when bending or squat to do work. Example: Watching etc. Not exercise related. How to overcome this? This 
it sounds like the stiffness of the joints actually. So it needs to be ascertained, and you know, then we can talk about what to do, uh, how to overcome it. Um, last question we have in the box is: uh, Will scoliosis causes muscle tense and back pain? Yeah. Will stretching help? Um, to me, uh, when when I was working in HKL, I still do some uh, see some patients uh, uh, who have scoliosis, and a lot of them actually do not have pain. So scoliosis and back pain are two different things, and I see that scoliosis is actually not a painful condition, except in a minority and a very rare case. All right, so uh, scoliosis does not cause back pain. Now muscle tense, no. Uh, muscles sometimes, you know, you, you feel that, you know, your, your, your neck muscles or your shoulder muscles are actually tense. No? A lot of us would think that this is because of the muscle, the muscle is giving you pain or, you know, some, some people would say that this is stress and all that. Um, I look at muscle stiffness, muscle tense as a form of protective mechanism. Now, muscles, they move us. Okay, I've showed you earlier on in my lecture, but at the same time, they play a protective role. So like somebody is about to hit you, you will tense up your tummy, or if you're about to fall, you will actually brace yourself. So the thing is that the muscle is trying to protect your neck if your joints in your neck are stiff, right? So if the joints are stiff, it, the, the joints will tell the, the, the muscles, the brain, and the brain will tell the muscle, tighten it, don't let it move. And when you move, you feel pain, and you know that's, that goes back into that vicious cycle. So the idea is to understand, oh, I have stiffness, I have to stretch, okay? So um, actually we have two uh, questions, I guess we are just going to quickly answer them. Should, doctor, should we put a towel under the waist at night when we sleep? I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> just if it works for you all right uh, usually pe most people will put towel at the neck if if you have back pain sometimes you can do that but i i wouldn't recommend it actually uh you sleep like how we we how you normally would sleep <laughs> okay and our last question this is really last question uh, i am still having back pain for many years despite doing rehabilitation exercise but doctor mentioned just now that pain can go within few weeks with movement and exercise so what the problem with my pain for years? Okay. So this is somebody with uh, been having back pain and despite doing physio, you still have back pain. I, that represents quite a, quite a sizable portion of my patients that I, I see. The, the problem is, what is your understanding of the pain? What does it mean to you? All right? And what do you do to manage the pain? And the other problem is that sometimes when you do rehab, a lot of times they, um, you know, sometimes I, I, I see patients who treat rehab just like the spa, you know, so they go, they lie down there on their tummy, they put a hot bag, they do tens, they do a bit of ultrasound and that helps, you know, uh, for a while and they get up, they go down to their car and the pain starts again. So the key thing here is that sometimes to use the rehab as a, a, a gym. Again, there are other problems because it depends on the therapist that you, you know, that you are working with. Sometimes the therapist may just push you too hard, you know. So sometimes that's why I call physio the rapist, you know. <laughs> so again, to do things little by little. So with this kind of people, um, people with having persistent pain for a long time, I, I have to have a, you know understanding what's going on, and the approach is actually trying to get them to understand and to reconcile uh, what the pain is actually. So, so it's a different approach altogether. So maybe something is not right with whatever that they've been doing before. Perhaps we can fine tune that. All right. So I hope uh, the last question has been answered uh, by doctor. Uh, the guests probably were able to find out more later. So um, thank you so much, doctor, for being with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Aslan, for uh, sharing uh, such a fantastic, uh, knowledgeable, beneficial uh, information for most of us because... Uh, Many of all of us are stuck at home, okay, um, except those who are in uh, frontliners or essential services. Uh, and um, I think this talk had come at the right timing because uh, I was also beginning to feel shoulder ache and I was told that to stretch more every time, stand up every half an hour. So thank you so much to Dr. Aslan and to everyone who have joined us here today. Uh, special thanks to also to Glenn Eagles, our marketing team who are with us, Serena, for organizing our talk uh, for so many months. Uh, this is actually our 23rd episode. We have started our monthly virtual talk since April 2020 when first uh, MCO first started. Uh, the pioneers of uh, financial services are thinking that this would be a fantastic way to give back to uh, the people, okay, our clients, our new friends, our family. 
to find out more and uh, to learn while we are stuck at home. So in front of the screen, you'll be able to see this is uh, Dr. Aslan's um, picture, handsome picture, and his uh, um, clinic in Glen Eagles, okay, uh, clinic telephone number. Feel free to uh, call in to make an appointment if you need more information uh, with Dr. Aslan. Actually, we have a patient wanted to share her uh, MRI uh, results, but I think uh, probably it's better if she can make an appointment to see Dr. Aslan directly. You know, one of the things that I always like to tell, uh, I get asked this a lot, can you have a look at my MRI report? And, you know, I, I just uh, approach it this way. If you go to a, you know, uh, an art gallery and you look at a piece of drawing uh, and art, you know, and you're interpreting it on your own, you know, you will only understand the piece of art once you have met the artist. So you need to actually see the artist before you look at the paintings. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes, if you want to find out more, see Dr. Aslan. Uh, the next uh, slide that I have is a feedback form. Uh, please take out your phone to uh, scan the feedback form. Give us your feedback. Uh, what do you like about uh, today's talk? We will forward to Dr. Aslan and the marketing team. Okay, or if you have any ideas to share with us, please feel free to put into the feedback form. Um, Glen Eagles is our uh, uh, sponsor for all our talks for so many months, I think for more than one year, one year and uh, one year plus. Uh, feel free to follow them in their Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and also um, in Instagram. Okay, they have a lot of information on their website. Okay, videos as well, very interesting information. And our Prudential is part of uh, the Pioneers. Pioneers are uh, part of Prudential uh, Insurance and also Pru Besant Takafu. And uh, feel free to approach any of our wealth planner to find out more if you have any financial services needs. Prudential just launched a Pruton Premier, which is a large sum assured coverage of our clients who has that needs for legacy or income protection. Okay, our next talk is going to be on 15th of August, which is a Sunday, three o'clock. And the topic that we're going to speak uh, next month uh, is actually so timely as well on the COVID-19 uh, mental health issues that uh, many of us are facing now. Please uh, register, okay, scan to register and the registration uh, will be confirmed, will receive. You will receive the Zoom link and ID nearer to the event date. Okay, yep, all right, I'll put this again at the end. Okay, so this is me. Uh, feel free to get connected with me in IG or Facebook and also because I also update on our talks on a monthly basis. And uh, lastly, I just want to share that at the Pioneers Financial Services, we are a group they are committed to help our clients, our new clients, uh, in uh, ensuring that other uh, financial services are, are met. So we have a Facebook group. Feel free to uh, like and join us because uh, ongoing, we have a lot of events ongoing as well, such as a Mandarin talk coming up okay, uh, next weekend as well. All right. So with this, we are going to end our session for today. Thank you once again to Dr. Aslan for joining us, for sharing today. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, stay safe. Hope to see you soon. Okay, take good care. And I hope you bring our number down. Okay, take care everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.